So we're going to continue in, the, in Song of Solomon. And so we have uh, taken a few weeks off of Song of Solomon. And so we've done about 10 sessions in the Song of Solomon so far. And so we're going to finish chapter 3 today. <coughs> and uh, if you... If, you're, if, if Song of Solomon is new to you or you're not familiar with it, I'd really encourage you to check out uh, the messages beforehand on our website. So I'll just to give a moment here. So and then also on Wednesday nights, uh, I just want to reiterate so we're doing this family prayer time. The, the fast was so good of being together, praying together, having our kids to, there with us. And so we want to continue that. And so it meets at 6.30. And so we're asking everyone to bring a snack to share. Um, so we'll meet from, so eat dinner before you come. And then we'll uh, pray together from 6.30 to 7.30. And then we will eat together and have fellowship and just enjoy each other from 7.30 till whenever you go home. Um, and so that's every Wednesday night starting in two weeks, right? in two weeks on the 21st. Okay, so Song of Solomon. So if you're not familiar with the Song of Solomon, it's an eight-chapter love song between King Solomon and the Shulamite. And so there's a number of ways, a couple, of, a few different ways to interpret it. One is the physical, literal interpretation between King Solomon as a husband and his bride. But the other way to interpret it is a spiritual interpretation, which is between Jesus, the bridegroom, and his church, the bride. And it's the story of divine love that he, he draws us into and the story of holy, the progression of holy love for, um, for the Shulamite, which is the bride, which is us. And so we've been looking at it that way. That's been the primary interpretation through church history and through, and through Jewish rabbis, actually, is as an allegory or a spiritual song that's been interpreted this way. And so I want to do a, just a little review because <clears throat> we're in chapter 3, at the end of chapter 3 here. And uh, it won't make sense. I mean, it will a little bit. But this is a really important section that has a lot of symbolism in it. Okay, this section at the end of chapter 3. Uh, and so in, in chapter, uh, we looked at in chapter 1 and chapter 2, it's all about our identity, who we are in Christ as the bride. And she understands her identity in, at the beginning of her journey. Now, at the beginning of our journeys, we're all immature. We fall in love with Jesus. He touches our hearts. He wins us over. Love is awakened. And, but we're immature in our love and in our knowledge about the bridegroom. We, we don't know him real well, but we're excited and love is real. Right? I remember when I, was, I got saved at 20 years old at college and I was on fire and I didn't even know what I was on fire for. <laughs> I was like, you know, like you're on college campus doing college ministry and going to prayer meetings and evangelism and, and I mean, I was just like, and, uh, but I didn't know anything. You know, I was like 20 years old. I didn't know the Bible at all, and, uh, but well, that was real to me. And so, and that's the, really the beginning of our journey. <clears throat> and in chapter 2 here, right, uh, there's just so much here, but it just begins, she says, I'm the rose of Sharon, I'm the lily of the valleys, I meaning she's the rose unto the Lord, and the, and the purity of God is upon her. And what ends up happening here is as, as she's been meditating just and feeding upon the faithfulness, the goodness of God, and just falling in love with him, the Lord comes in different ways to reveal himself to her, just like he does in our lives. In different seasons of our lives, he will reveal himself in different ways. And here he comes and reveals himself as the conquering king, the one that effortlessly will, will uh, rule the nations. And he invites her to come with, her, with him to the mountains. And unfortunately, in her maturity, she loves the Lord, but out of fear, she says no. She denies the Lord and says, no, I can't go. It's too scary. There's too much unknown. Um, I, I'm not, I love you, but I, I can't go. And so that's chapter 2. And then in chapter 3, she's searching for him. 
And it says that she was searching for him on her bed at night, just like before. It's like she just loved the, you know, the, before it used to be vineyard songs, you know, and now it's, I don't know what kind of, you know, IHOP or Bethel or Hillsong. I don't know. I don't even know what Josh Ewing CDs, you know. you just like, you just put it in and you're just soaking and you're just in love and you just love that feeling. And that's what she was used to. But the Lord said, that's great, but there's also a work to do in the kingdom. Right? And so he was, like, he was inviting her to go, but out of fear, she says no. And then she's searching for him again, just like she's always searched for him. Right? <clears throat> uh, now it's, you don't put the CD in. Right? It's like put on your earbuds or whatever you do, you know, listen. And, um, and she's searching for him the same way, but he's not there. And, she go, and he brings her through a season of divine discipline. Okay, chapter 3 is a season of divine discipline. Very interesting because you'll see there's a couple different times where the Lord really pauses or takes time in her development. And one is this other area before where um, in chapter 2, verse 7, where it's like he's saying, no, you need to know who you are. You need to know your identity. You need to know that you're loved. And you need to know the truths about what I've done for you and who you are. And in our lives, we need to take a season and go, and go this is who I am in Christ. Right? This is what my sonship means or being a daughter. Right? And these foundations of the word of God. This is really important for us to grow and to continue. In chapter 3, though, the season of waiting where the Holy Spirit's going, we're going to take time here. Don't rush it. Because we always want to go to the next thing. He's like, no, no, no. Let's take our time. And in chapter 3, very interestingly, it's the season of discipline. He's like, don't leave the season of discipline too hastily. That's what the Holy Spirit was saying there. Going, no, no. There's areas, John, especially Hebrews 12, how the, the discipline of the Lord is actually for our good. It's for our growth. It's so that we can partake of his righteousness. And there's things that God does during seasons of discipline that he doesn't do in any other times. It's hard to understand and to go through, but what we gain and how we grow out of those seasons, there's no other way we could learn, right? Because he's all about our growth, because he wants us to partner with him, chapter 8, to go to the, whether it's the nations or whatever he has over our lives, he wants partnership with us. And so he wants to develop us through different seasons of our lives. And so that's chapter 3. So that, that's preceding this verse 6 here in Song of Solomon, chapter 3, verse 6 through 11. And so, you know, she's searching for him during this season of discipline. She finds him. And then we'll, let's read verse 6 through 11, and then we'll, uh, and then we'll start going through it a little bit. So verse 6 says, what is this coming up from the wilderness like columns of smoke perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all scented powders of the merchant? Behold, it is the traveling couch of Solomon, 60 mighty men around it, of the mighty men of Israel. All of them are wielders of the sword, expert in war. Each man has his sword at his side, guarding against the terrors of the night. King Solomon has made for himself a sedan chair from the timber of Lebanon, he made its posts of silver and its back of gold and its seat of purple fabric with its interior lovingly fitted out by the daughters of Jerusalem. In verse 11, go forth, O daughters of Zion, and gaze upon King Solomon with the crown with which his mother has crowned him on the day of his wedding and on the day of his gladness of heart. And so it's a very interesting passage because there is a lot of symbolism here. Okay, and so we're going to unpack it a little bit. And in the notes, I, actually, I wanted to um, put a lot in here actually about the symbolism because the symbolism or allegory is interpreted in the scriptures. Right? These truths are interpreted in the New Testament or in other parts of the scriptures. And so, but this passage is so important because out of this, he's, he's re- the Holy Spirit's revealing Jesus as the safe Savior here. Okay, he's revealing Jesus as the Savior that the maiden can trust and believe because without knowing him as the safe Savior, there's no way we could continue to go with him into the unknown. Right? The places where he wants to take us, where it's dangerous, where it's risky, where we're going to the mountains, 
Well, there's no way that she would say yes until she has a revelation that he's safe and that he can, she can trust him. And so here in verse 6, it begins, this question comes out. What is this coming out or who is this? Uh, the King James translates it. Who is this coming up from the wilderness? And the idea is that it's Jesus that's overcome through the journey of this sinful world. And he has come out of the sinful world in, through his life, death, and his, and his ascension into heaven, that he has overcome this sinful, sinful world. And the question there is that the Holy Spirit's asking is, who is this? Who is this? Or how did he do it? And here the, he asks, what is this or who is this coming up from the wilderness? And it's these four uh, symbols here in verse 6. It says, like columns of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all scented powders of the merchant. Okay. And so here, it's, it's revealing Jesus as the safe Savior. I mean, you're like, what is this talking about? <laughs> it's talking about smoke and merchants and, you know, myrrh and frankincense. Um, but really, well, as we go through it, you'll see here, because really, smoke in the Old Testament is the language of the tabernacle, and it's referring to the manifest presence of God. Okay? Whenever the manifest presence of God, smoke would come. I mean, think about Mount Sinai. When he came on the mountain, it was full of smoke and fire. Okay? And here, it's speaking of Jesus, that he ascended into heaven right, as columns of smoke, and he ascended, and he was perfumed with myrrh and frankincense. And myrrh was a burial spice okay, in the New Testament. And frankincense speaks of inc inc uh, incense or intercession. Okay, speaks of incense and intercession. And in this passage here, the revelation of Jesus as a safe Savior is given two different ways. The first, in verse 7 and 8, is that he, it's through a military language, what we'll see here in 7 and 8. And then in verses 9 and 10, it's given through this royal wedding procession, okay? as a royal wedding procession. And it's given so that they could understand that he is a safe savior, both that he's the one that can protect, but he's also the one that can bring her to, with him to the very end. Okay? And this will make more sense as we go here. And so letter B, the revelation of Jesus as a safe savior allows the bride to trust him through all the trials and seasons of life. It does not mean that the difficulties will be removed, but it does mean that Jesus will lead us to overcome and to bring us to a place where our hearts can mature in trust and obedience. Okay? And so we all have difficulties in life, and he wants us to, he wants to put us in a position where we can trust him and he'll lead us, and if we will trust him, our hearts will grow, and if we don't trust him, and, and we don't, then we actually won't grow, and we can't fulfill what God has for us, because the different things in our lives will, they're like strongholds, and we'll say, no, I can't do that, I can't go there, I don't, tr I don't know if you're going to protect me, I don't know if you're going to provide for me, I don't know if you're going to lead me, I don't know if you're going to speak to me, and these different fears and immaturity actually overwhelm us. Okay? And so here, if you look on the bottom of page one, the ascended Christ, there's three symbolic references in verse six, right, which speak to Christ's victorious ascension into heaven. It's referenced as the smoke, the myrrh, and the frankincense. And, and this, you have the verses here. Uh, but the smoke speaks of his ascension, his, uh, his sacrifice on the earth, when he laid down his life on the cross, it, it, the, the, it was the, the sacri as the smoke of the sacrifices ascended upward as a sweet savor to God, so Jesus' sacrifice in God's fire ascended upwards like a pillar of smoke. Okay? And so his sacrifice was like the smoke, and that's what it's referring to. The myrrh, he's perfumed with myrrh. Myrrh speaks of Christ's death. Remember, uh, when, even when he was born, Right? The wise men brought gifts, and myrrh, frankincense, and gold. And he's perfumed with myrrh as he died on the cross, which allowed him to be received into heaven. It was his death, the sacrificial death of Christ, 
in which the Father received his blood and received his sacrifice. Right. Let's go to page two. And then he's perfumed with frankincense, which speaks of his fragrant intercession. Right. So uh, Hebrews 7.25 was one of the verses that says, he lives forever to make intercession for us. Okay. And as a high priest, when he entered into heaven, very interesting, the book of Hebrews, he didn't just die and go up into heaven. He actually went into the real holy of holies in heaven as a forerunner for us, meaning the, the holy of holies on the earth in the temple and the tabernacle were a copy of the real holy of holies in heaven. And when Jesus died, he actually went into the real one in heaven, purified it, made the way for us on earth the veil was torn well in heaven he made the way so that when we are saved and we're sons and daughters we can actually enter into the holy of holies in heaven and so as a high priest he went ahead of us through his death by the myrrh and then by his intercession he entered that place for us and then he allows us to go in and to be able to have relationship and to receive from the god of glory in heaven above that's why we're seated now in places, in heavenly places right now. That's where we're seated. Though we're here, we're really seated up there with him right now. And we have free access to his glory, to his emotions, to all that he wants to give us. He's given it to us through the work of the cross, through the work of his sacrifice of Jesus. It's fully ours right now. And he makes that way for us. It's Hebrews 6 here in verse 19. He says, this, is, this hope we have is an anchor of the soul, a hope both sure and steadfast, and one in which enters within the veil. And he's talking about the veil in heaven where Jesus has entered as a forerunner for us. And because he entered in, he makes the way for us to enter in. That's why Hebrews 4, we can come boldly before the throne of grace. Why? Because he's before that throne. He's entered in and made the way for us he paid the way by his blood and entered in. And so in the last part of verse 6 here, it says, with all scented powders of the merchant. And it's this idea of the merchant here, it speaks of Jesus' commitment to the bride, his commitment to us. Right? So the merchant's powder speaks of his commitment to us. Uh, his bride, Jesus spoke of merchants who sold everything to purchase the beautiful pearls uh, in, in the Gospels. Remember Ma in Matthew 13, I have the verse here, it says that the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking fine pearls. And upon finding one pearl of great value, he went and sold all that he had and he bought it. And so this parable really goes both ways. Right? Jesus sold all that he had, meaning he gave up of his own life so that he could purchase us by his life. But for the same thing goes for us. When we find him, what do we do? We repent of our old life so that we can gain what he has for us. And so it goes both ways here. And so a merchant was scented as a result of handling the perfume powders in the marketplace, the buying and the selling. And it's just this picture here, it's Jesus is the perfume merchant who sold everything he had in his deep commitment to us. This means that he gave up everything that he had and it reveals the depth of his commitment. And the way that Paul says it, especially in Romans, is this. If Jesus suffered for us, and we know he did, remember Romans 5, it says, while we were yet sinners, he died for us. Meaning, at our worst place, when we we're enemies of God and not seeking him, that's when Christ came and, and made a sacrifice on our behalf. And Paul says, if while we were at our worst, Christ suffered for us, right, and we believe him now, because how much more will he now take care of us and be uh, tender towards us? Okay? And he says this again in, in Romans 8, or here, uh, Romans 5 and verse 10. It says very clearly, it says, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, it says, how much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Right? Meaning if he gave us everything when we were his enemies, now we're his bride, 
he's, he's going to give us everything and more. You know, it's like if he can give us more, it's like, it's like he is so committed to us because we're his very own. Okay? Uh, he says this in Romans 8.32. Uh, God says, he who did not spare his own son but delivered him over for us all. He goes, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? I mean, if we were at our worst and we we're enemies of God and he, and he gave up himself at that time, now that we're his bride, we're his favorite, we're the ones that he loves, I mean, he will spoil us in that sense. He will be with us to the very end. Okay? And this is uh, what it's talking about here in verse 6, that with the scented powders of the merchants, it's his commitment to us, that he's committed to us to the very end. Okay? He's committed to us to the very end. And the reason why this is so important in letter F is because Song of Solomon 3.6 here, it shows us that during our journey through this sinful and painful world, Jesus will protect us from our sins and all that comes against us through his death and intercession. Because this, the journey through this world is full of sin, not just, not just our sin, but sins that's done against us and just the sin of the world. Right? It says about Lot that his righteous soul right, was, um, what's the word? Tormented. Was tormented, yeah. Right? It was tormented because of the atmosphere in Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot's soul. And so, I mean, and so here, as we go through, we're, we will all endure pain. Right? We'll all endure lots of pain, uh, trials, hurts, as part of being in this broken world and broken life. Okay? And, and it's like, what do we do with that? The answer is, is that Jesus will lead us. He'll protect us. And he's going to uh, go into this more. He'll protect us and he'll be with us. It doesn't mean the trials go away. Okay? It doesn't mean, you know, like the relationship that hurt us will, will always be better. Sometimes it will. But other times, they never change. Okay? If it was a spouse or a dad or a mom and they've hurt us, and now in Christ, it, we're in Christ, it doesn't mean that that spouse is going to repent, okay? Or they're going to be better or they're going to be reconciled. It doesn't always mean that. But what it does mean is that we have Jesus that will lead us, he will comfort our hearts, and he will t uh, take us through this world where we don't have to live as a victim to what's happened to us. But we overcome by grace and through the cross and his intercession, that we can overcome the trials of this world and we are victorious and we can have a free heart. Meaning we can forgive, we can live in peace, we can love our enemies, even if they never say they're sorry and acknowledge their hurt to us. Because so many go, I am not going to move on. And they might not say this, but it's, it's entrenched in their hearts going, until they say they're sorry. It's like, until my dad comes to me and says, I'm sorry that I did not raise you right. You know, or, or a spouse. Until they come and say, I'm sorry for leaving you and hurting you. Okay? And they're stuck in bitterness and just holding that with anger and pain. And really what the scripture says is, if you don't forgive, well, he won't, he won't forgive us. But if we don't forgive, we're, we create our own prison by our unforgiveness. Instead of us imprisoning ourselves through anger, bitterness, the lies, all of that, he said, he goes, there's a way in which, which we can overcome and we can actually bless our enemies and love them. Those that hurt us the most, usually the ones that hurt us the most are the ones that are most closest to us. That's why it hurts so much. Now, someone on the side of the road, they say something, you're like, okay, whatever, they're crazy, you know? <laughs> But when your brother or your mom, your dad, your spouse says that, saint says that, all of a sudden it's very deep, of course, because we've given them access to our heart. And when they break that and hurt us, it's so painful. Okay? And life is full of pain in a lot of ways. It's full of joy as well in Christ. But there's a lot of pain. And with that, it's like, what do we do? And here, Jesus is the safe Savior who will lead us and guide us so that we can overcome and we don't have to be enslaved or entrapped by what's done to us. Right? Living in shame and guilt uh, and anger, 
having offenses with people. I, I, I tell this to people all the time. I go, I have to keep telling myself, I say it a lot, I go, don't, don't be offended. Don't, I tell myself, I say it out loud, I go, don't be offended with that person. Don't, because there's expectations, there's just all kinds of things, and the thing you wanna do is be offended. And offense is a choice. Okay? And I go, and even then I still get offended. <laughs> you know, it's like, but it's like, don't be offended, don't be offended, don't be offended, because, you know, been down that road many times, and it just hurts my, it hurts me, okay? And so, to be able to leave the comfort zone, meaning to follow him on the mountains, okay, we have to know that he is a safe savior. Okay? That he has our best in mind. He wants, he wants to heal us. But even if you're on the mission field or you're going doing what God calls you, okay, or you finally get married or whatever, and you're like, oh, that marriage is going to solve all my problems. That girl is going to solve all my problems. And, that's, and it's actually not really going to happen. <laughs> okay? right? Marriage is great, but they're not going to solve all your, all your problems. Okay, or going on the mission field, like, yes, I finally I made it on the mission field. And really what will happen is that mission field, when you go, it will expose all the things, all the cracks that are here right now, it will expose it to a greater depth. Okay? Just like that marriage will. Because right? you're much more vulnerable and intimate. Okay? And all your hopes going, man, Miss, Mr. Wright's going to solve all my problems. Hallelujah. And pretty soon you'll be like, what is wrong with Mr. Wright? <laughs> Get it? That's pretty good. What's, what's wrong with Mr. Wright? Right? Because, because you're like, oh, he's going to take care of me. He's going to love me. He's going to do this. He's going to accept me. I mean, there's so many ideas that we have. And really, there's only one Savior that can, that can help us. Right? And, it's, and it's Jesus. So he's a safe Savior. And so this, this idea of actually growing and being able to trust him is really important. Because if we don't trust him, learn how to trust him now, we actually won't be able to trust him in the things that he has for us. Okay? I've seen, and I've, like, and I'm going to get ahead of myself a little bit here, but this, it goes from seeing Jesus as a safe savior to actually gazing upon him as the, as the um, beloved, um, uh, as the bridegroom king. Okay, the, the foundation of Jesus as a safe savior is what allows us to know him as the bridegroom king. Okay? In this passage, it's very interesting. That's the shift or the invitation, meaning because most people know him as you know, the savior. He, he forgives us of our sins, right? the, the Jesus of Christmas. Right? And you know, it's like, okay, repent. You know, he loves you and he's gonna, you know, you're going to heaven, which is true and great, forgives us of our sins. But that's the introduction and the way to actually be able to follow him and partner with him, the key is, this, is going from knowing him as a safe savior to gazing upon him as the bridegroom king. Okay? And it, that's what, actually, that's what the whole passage is about. It's transitioning us or taking us deeper to know Jesus as the bridegroom king. And as we do, it will allow us to trust him because we'll know his love and we'll know his authority. And when we do, then we can actually go into the mountains with him in partnership. Okay? Let me just, and it's not in the notes. I was, I was just thinking about this during the worship. It's, you know, when we have uh, struggles, sins in our lives right now, okay? Let's say it's whatever it is, you know, our integrity, our character, um, sins, that private sins that no one knows about, things like that. When we have those in our lives now, we won't, go, we won't go further with God in either in ministry, really, unless we are able to overcome those things. Okay? Now, let me say it this way. I've seen more people go further because of their talent, their anointing, and their gifts. They write it. Okay? <clears throat> but what ends up happening is if our character and our inner life with God isn't developed, they'll go further for a while, but they'll come crashing because their character can't sustain the platform or the gifts or the notoriety or the money or the fame or the ministry or whatever it is. Their character can't sustain it, and actually it comes and, and undercuts them. 
right? And so it's like when you're young or at the beginning, you're like, oh, yeah, I'm anointed. Everyone loves me. I can speak and move people's hearts and this and that. And so what they think, what they think where they're at is actually they're writing their gift. They're writing the anointing that God's given them. And they, and they write it. The problem is their character is not developed. It's not tested. Okay? Their, their, their relationship with the Lord is weak. It's not deep. They don't know the scriptures. They don't really know who Jesus is that well. But their anointing and, care, and, their anointing and gifts are so strong. Right? And, that's, and that's God's business. It's so strong that it can overcome that for a season and for a while. That it will, they can go further. The problem is, the further you go on giftings without character, the greater fall you'll have at the end. Okay? I've seen it many times. Going, wow, they, it's like you rode your gifting all the way, and everyone loved you and all of that, but it set you up for, that, for a greater fall. So let me, put, let me put it this way. The way David talks about it is this. He says, he, in this private life, he killed the lion and the bear. Right? In this private life, he killed the lion and the bear. Because he killed the lion and the bear, meaning he had the reality of knowing God in his life and victory in his personal life, he was actually able to kill Goliath. And so there's a, in the end times, so I'm just throwing some different ideas at this. In the end times, it's we're all afraid of persecution and suffering, right? And that will kill us physically or hurt us physically. But you know what the, what the greatest warning that God gives us in the end times is about? Heart growing cold, cold. yeah, falling away. Yeah, the number one thing over and over is this, don't be deceived. It's actually don't be deceived. Why? Because deception kills us spiritually. And the worst deception is self-deception. Okay. Meaning this, you think, and I think, we're at a place where we're not. And we think we can handle, or we're mature, or we've grown, or we know this and know that. And a lot of times it's because we know we have connections, a network. Oh, I know them, and I know them, so I must have my life in God like them. Or we think we can handle things, and we actually don't. It's not real in our life. And so we progress thinking or we want, you know, uh, notoriety or to grow or, you know. And what really, it's like this area, this is why training, wilderness, what, he, what Jesus is uh, doing here is so important with, with, in Song of Solomon. Because he's saying, he goes, look, you have a season of discipline. You have to know him as the safe savior and then the uh, bridegroom king. Why? So that you can actually overcome things in your own life right now when it's simple and small. Because right? when you do that, you'll actually gain an authority and there's a reality to your heart and life. And then when, you go, when he brings you into the mountains and he calls you and it's risky, and a lot of risk is unknown. You're like, well, you want, I remember the first time I was like, I'm going like, to like, go to Iraq. I said, okay. And then I go, I'm going to die there. You know, it's like, this is all these thoughts. You're like, I'm going to die there. Like, I, I'm, you get, you're scared because you don't know, right? And you're like, I've never been there. And, I, and all these thoughts going, what am I going to do? Should I get life insurance? You know, like, <laughs> you know I was like, what am I going to do? <laughs> what about my kids? <laughs> my, my wife, like, how do I take care of them if I don't come back? You know, it's like all these crazy thoughts are going through your head, right? Because it's unknown, right? And without the reality of the victory of Christ in our life now, it's actually really hard to keep going with him when it's scary and it's unknown. And I would say most of you young ones, right, in the next 20, 30 years or whatever, you have so many places that he's inviting you to. It will be the most exciting but dangerous but challenging but, but satisfying time in all of human history is coming up ahead of us. And it's, we're going to see the outpouring of the Spirit. We're going to see, you guys are going to see things that we've only prayed about huh, and labored for and dreamed about as your fathers and mothers. It's like, we're like, Lord, bring revival, pour out miracles, pour out your Spirit. Well, it's actually for your generation. You're the ones that are going to walk in those things and you're going to see it 
and you're going to see the greatest harvest. You're going to see light and darkness are going to clash in the nations like never before. Okay? It's actually happening right now. Darkness is increasing at a rate that we've never seen. And the scripture is so clear. If darkness is increasing that way, so will the light and the authority of the church, the authority of Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Okay? And we will see the gospel go and the kingdom like never before. And I believe that this, this younger generation, you will see and walk into things. I'm telling you, we only dream about. We touch it here and there. And maybe just a little degree of it. it God will pour out his spirit, Joel 2, upon all flesh and through all the nations. And he will use the church to bring vindication and to validate the person of Christ and the gospel. Someone's got, you guys are going to go. You know, wherever it is. It could be in our, your own state your own hometown, into the nations, wherever. But as you go, though, right, this is why we're so just about training your hearts, you know, we, with so much emphasis, because we don't want to see you go, and then as you're, you're not ready, and the pressures and the excitement and all of that, actually, you can't handle. Right? And what it does is it actually hurts you in greater ways, because you're not ready. Your hearts aren't ready. You don't know what to do. I'm telling you, with success comes the greatest pressures. Okay? Failure is actually pretty easy to handle. Okay? And difficulties are easy. There's not much you can do. But with success, there come so many options of lust and temptation with success. That's why it says, be aware when everyone speaks well of you. When everyone wants you. When you have more money than you've ever had and don't know what to do with. Right? Every revival brings so much money. Yeah, it's like money is the least of the issues with re when, when revivals come. When God moves, money is not an issue at all. Well, I think Rabbi was talking about a thousand cattle on a thousand hills or something like that. I'm like, he owns the whole world. It's like money is not an issue. Wherever there's revival, there's so much gold. Okay? People just bring it. Why? Their lives are being touched like never before. Money's never been an issue in, in the moves of God. Okay? The problem is this. Who's going to steward that money? You can't steward your checking account now. Right? You can't steward $1,000 a month you're making now. Right? I mean, like, those are the realities. Okay? And you're like, you're fudging on this and cutting corners here. And, you know, and I just say that because it's, like, it's so important. Because even like, personal, like, you're in pornography now and you're thinking, when I get married, that's going to help me get out of it. That's the, that's, the, that's the magic pill. When I get married, I'm going to get out. And it's not. Okay? It's like if we don't have victory in reality now, there's no way we're going to be able to follow the Lamb wherever He goes and to actually sustain it. Okay? And that's what this, I mean, part of this is because in chapter 3 here, he's, he's, he's revealing the safe Savior. He's revealing the bridegroom king. And then in chapter 4, uh, Jesus just speaks all these truths to the to the. Uh, to the maiden, to the bride. And at the end of chapter 4, she's, she says, Come, O, o north wind. And in chapter 5, it's the Jesus of Gethsemane that comes next. Meaning, there's a place of willingly laying our lives down to suffer with him. Okay? And all of those areas where you're like, I'm willingly laying down my life so I can suffer with my Jesus. Those areas are developed here, knowing him as a savior that we can trust. Knowing him as a bridegroom king, that he loves us with an intensity and a passion that we have to know the reality of. That will allow us to overcome our sins, our, you know, our, our doubts, or whatever it is, our fears, our anxiety. If you have, think of, if you have anxiety now, right, you're like, the mission field's way harder. <laughs> it's way harder. And you have anxiety now, and you can't, and we're in trouble with that, you can't overcome that. You're like, it's a pipe dream to think, oh yeah, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna soar on the mission field. Okay? When we were, I remember when we were young, we went to Mexico and um, that we went to this uh, there was a camp, uh, like a mission camp, and the husband wanted to be there and the wife didn't. We didn't know this. We were just we came in buses, you know, and uh, served there, and their marriage was in trouble, and we could see tension, 
right? Their marriage was in trouble. What we found out later is the husband wanted to be there, so brought the wife. The wife never wanted to go, okay? And later, like a year or two later, they actually ended up leaving and closing the mission base, right? Because their marriage couldn't handle just the ten I mean, we lived, it was almost outside. It was a hole right in the middle of the camp. And so it's like you're just living out, you know, and the pressures of that. And, um, and, you, and so it's like the things that he wants to bring, he wants us to succeed, meaning he wants us to partner in those things. But the way to develop that is going, we have to have victory, meaning we have to be able to trust him now. Right? When we freak out now going, oh, how am I going to pay my bills? Okay, which is true. Okay? And it's not bad. It's like, but he wants to develop that going, let me show you that I'm faithful to you now. Because right? our little, you know, $100 bill or you know, $300 bill is nothing compared to, you got a million dollar bill here. And it's real because you're doing the conference. And you got to pay for this. And you go, oh no, I remember when, I, when he was provided for my cell phone bill, for my rent, for all these things, and it was low. And now you're like, God, I'm organizing a crusade. And that same faith, well, I learned it there. I saw him come through. I can trust you for this. Right? It's the same principle. But we have to see it, the reality of him coming through and, and being real. Because we, we say this, like, I always ask people, going, how can you trust him for eternal things when we can't trust him for physical things? Like, which is harder? Right? Which is harder? Paying your rent now or actually getting into heaven forever? Right? It's like, if we can't trust him for eternal things, and we're like, we don't, you know, we don't trust him, so I'm, I'm not going to obey, I'm going to do my own thing. Why? Because I can't make a few hundred dollars, or a couple thousand dollars, or whatever it is. And you're like, it's a pipe dream to think, oh, I, tr I trust him here, you know? When it really, it's like, the material, the physical things, earthly things, speak of the invisible. Okay? These are all lessons. Where it's like, no, we need to learn that Jesus really is our provider. He is our healer. He is our leader. He is safe with him. That we can follow him in the darkest areas. Even the darkest areas of our own soul. Because that's a lot of people, are, those areas torment us more than anything physical. It's actually the things in our soul. Right? That, that's either happened to us and all of that. And well, if we can't overcome those things, 10, 20, 30 years, like, it is hard to follow him in the deeper areas. Right? But that's what he has for you. Okay? And that's why this is so important here, this time. So let's, let's look at verse 7, look at the next uh, two things real quickly here. Because I want to, this is so good. Um, here, page 3, okay, it's a twofold description of Jesus' protection. Okay? He protects us by grace, in his grace by the Holy Spirit. Okay? That's the picture in verse 7 and 8. And what he does is, it's the this. This traveling couch of Solomon is the gospel couch. Okay, it's actually the gospel couch. It's the invitation uh, to the gospel. And in Christ, Jesus builds this couch and he invites us into it. Okay, that's what it says later. He builds it and he invites us into it. And we sit next to him, meaning we're seated in heavenly places. And he's overcome powers and principalities in Ephesians 1. And that's where we are with him in the gospel. And in the gospel, we are protected by the Holy Spirit. Right? He is an expert in war and knows how to guard us, Amen. knows how to lead us, knows how to fight our battles, knows how to speak to us and warn us. It's the Holy Spirit's job. And it's pictured here by these 60 men that are experts of war. And so when we trust them, when we ride the gospel chariot right, through this fallen world, that's the invitation. We come into the gospel. We ride that chariot he protects us through grace and by his Holy Spirit. And it's our safety as the bride. Okay. Um, the second picture here in verse 9 and 10 is, is, this, um, is as a bride, the royal procession. And it's, I mean, there's, so, there's actually a lot here. Um, but it's our protection as a bride. So he makes this chariot in verse 9. It says he makes this sedan chair and he makes it for the bride. Okay. And just look, look at page four real quick. Uh, it's, it's called, it's, 
He says it's made with the timber of Lebanon. It's posts of silver. It's back of gold. It's see the purple fabric. It's interior lovingly fitted by the daughters of Jerusalem. And it's speaking here of the timber of Lebanon, right? Which is, it's, they're all uh, references to the tabernacle. And, uh, and here, you can see it here, but I'll just go, it's the wood in the tabernacle was covered with gold. The wood speaks of his humanity, and the gold speaks of his deity in the tabernacle. Right? It's how Jesus came forth as, as a perfect man. And um, the wood of Lebanon, it was the most beautiful, fragrant, expensive, and strongest wood. And the gospel was made by the strongest, yes, most costly flesh that ever walked the earth. Meaning, it was the sacrifice of Christ himself. Okay? And so it's, a, it's silver and gold here. It's the gospel chair is made of silver, which speaks of redemption, and gold, which speaks of divine character. The back, or the support of the gospel, is made of gold, meaning our protection in the gospel is established on God's infinite wisdom and his power. That's, right. Right? That's why we can trust him. The purple fabric, it's the gospel see, is purple, which speaks of royalty and God's authority into the life of the bride as the enemy comes to attack and harass us. Right? And it's laid, the interior is laid with love, or it's the interior of love. The inner workings of the gospel is paved with God's love. Okay. This reveals his motivation and his gentleness towards us. Remember earlier, it says, his banner over us is his love. Okay. And this is what it's for. Now, in his protection, look, let's go to verse 11. Because verse 11 is the, 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 the revelation of the safe Savior is the foundation for verse 11. Look at the command here, the invitation. Verse 11 says, go forth, O daughters of Zion. And look what he says. Gaze on King Solomon with the crown. And the invitation is, come, we're singing it tonight, gaze on King Solomon. Gaze on him. But he's not just a king here. He is a king, but he's a king that is going to have a wedding. Meaning he is the bridegroom king. And the invitation is, gaze on this bridegroom king. Okay? That's how we will grow and mature. Here. And so the invitation to gaze, look at I, here in um, what it will do is it will allow us to trust him at the deepest level so we can follow him into the most difficult circumstances with confidence. Okay? When we know the bridegroom king, it will give us confidence to follow him wherever he leads us. Because right? there's no guarantees of life. The only guarantee is he's with us. And the question is, is that enough? Okay? Because there is going to be a great martyrdom I mean, some, my guess would be some of us in this room will be martyrs okay, in the days to come. Okay? And it's like going, and it's going, what does that mean going? Yes, he leads us, and he'll lead us to a country or a place, but it doesn't mean it's safe. But it means he's with us, and it's his will. Right? And so, I mean, those are realities. At the, and when we talk, talk, start talking and preparing for the last days, these are the realities, and, and we have to know what we're facing and how to prepare our people and our own hearts for what's ahead for us. That's how we overcome. Okay? Um, and so he says the way we do that and prepare is one simple way. Because we have to look upon the bridegroom king. We have to know Jesus as our bridegroom king. Not just enter into the gospel, yes, but we have to grow from there and go, he's the bridegroom king. Isaiah 33, 17 says, your eyes will see the king in his beauty. Your eyes will see the king in his beauty. So the last page here, let's put just a few things. This fourfold wisdom, I know there's more, but of meditating on the bridegroom king. And so one is as we meditate on the bridegroom king, it allows us to enter in or to receive his intimate and passionate love for us. There's a love, this, this, the idea is a marital love, that picture, it's, there's a love like no other for us. Right? And it's only pictured in marriage, but, but Jesus has it for us. And he says, and we have to enter into it because it secures our identity as the bride. And as it does, uh, we'll know that he is leading us for our good, even if it's dangerous. Okay? That's what it does. Going, no, I know he's leading me for my good. This is his perfect will, even if I don't survive it. Right? I mean, and so here you go. This is the bridegroom king. Number two, it gives us confidence that Jesus is the conquering king with all power so that we can follow him into the unknown. 
that all authority has been given to him, Matthew 28, and that we can follow him and we can trust him because he has authority and power. Number three, here, it's at the end here, it says, with which his mother has crowned him on the day of his wedding and the day of his gladness of heart. Number three is this, longing for the wedding day secures our hearts to the age to come. Like there is a wedding day, Revelation 19, that's coming. And as we long for that, right, it actually anchors our heart into the, into the age to come. And that will help us in so many ways because it goes, when we anchor our hearts into the age to come, we're not looking at, okay, is this going to help me today? Like, is it going to help me tomorrow? It's not just a short view and going, wow, I'm going to trade in my, it's like uh, Esau, I'm going to trade in my birthright for a bowl of soup, you know? It's like we let our flesh dictate what we want to do. And he goes, no, there is an eternity waiting for us. And it allows us to go, no, I'm about that day. And we look and go, am I going to waste my time here? Am I going to give myself to that? What's it going to do for me? Does it align with that day? Does it align with that day? And so that anchors us into uh, the age to come. It gives us an eternal perspective and it roots us into eternity. Okay? It's what, um, uh, oh, what's his name? The first martyr, oh, I'm just blanking. Stephen. This is what Stephen did when he was looking. He, sa- he looked into heaven and he saw Jesus at the right hand. Okay? And he could undergo anything. Why? The vision goes, that's where I'm going. That's who I'm going to be with. Okay? And so it gives us perspective. Number four, we enter into the joy and the passion of the bridegroom's heart and his desire for his wedding day. This joy empowers us now as we wait. I mean, joy and love are two of the most, um, most strongest emotions and, that God has ever given. And it's like we enter into that joy all right? And it allows us to persevere and to follow. Okay. And, um, and so he says, meditate. And I, I know, and, and let this be real to us and take our time in this, that he's the bridegroom king. All right, last thing here. Right? It says, and it's the middle part here goes, with which his mother has crowned him. Okay? And what this means, the mother represents the church through history. Okay? It's, it represents the church through history. And the mother, or us, you can say us, the church crowns Jesus with our love. Right? Actually, we sang it with the very last song. We crown him. Okay? And think of this. We crown Jesus, the resurrected Christ. We crown him with our love. And he wears this crown. I mean, think of for all of eternity. I was just, it hit me the other day. I was going, I go, you know, we're going to look and go, that's my part of that crown. It's where I love him, where I choose him above all else. It's my sacrifice, my giving, my this, my that. He goes, when I say yes to him, he goes, we actually crown him with our love. And he wears it forever. In the age to come, I think we're going to go, that's part of my, my, what, the crown that he's wearing. I help build that. That's where I, that's where I fit in. And, the, and our love and our sacrifice is an adornment for him, and he wears it. And we're the only ones that can crown Jesus with our love. The angels can't do it. Creation can't do it. doesn't matter how powerful men are. Only the bride, the redeemed, as we choose him with love. We say no to other things, and we choose him. We say yes in obedience, in our sacrifice, in our devotion. All the different expressions. It crowns Jesus with our love. And it lasts forever. And so it, it does that. But then think about Jesus. He's the only, the most powerful man, uncreated God in all of eternity. He doesn't need us. Right? He's, he's self-sufficient. He spoke and he created. And yet he goes, I'm going to receive your love. Because your love moves my heart like no one else. That's what we'll find in in chapter 4. Your eyes, your song, your voice, your tears. You're wrestling with me. He goes, goes, I receive that as your devotion to me. I mean, think of that. Like, we, we can't even approach people to crown them. You know, it's like we want to crown you, President Biden, with this crown. And you're like, we can't even get to him. Okay, President Trump for you. 
<laughs> or, you know, or whoever. It's like, right? it's like, we can't even approach them. And yet we go, we can approach Jesus. Okay? And not only approach him, he goes, I receive your love for me. He desires it. And then when we crown him and he receives it, what does that tell us about ourselves in his eyes? What kind of value do we have that we can approach him, that we can stand before him, we can speak to him? And he doesn't go, oh, I, I, I take it, and then he forgets about it. You know, like, I do that a lot. You know, I forget about a lot. But it's like, he receives it, he remembers it forever, and then he rewards us for it. And he wears it like a trophy of grace going, you see that? Like, you know, it's like, when they were two, you know, five years old, they said this. When they were, you know, when Rick was struggling here, and he said, no, I'm going to go after him. He goes, I see that. Yeah. Right? And it's our, it's our, it says a remembrance, and he receives it as a crown. It's our love. And we're the only ones that have this. It's a privilege to be able to crown them with our sacrifice. Amen. To be able to crown them with our giving, of helping others, with our forgiveness of others. All these things, we crown Jesus because he's the one that made it possible. Okay? It's not just saying, we love you, we love you, which we do, but all the expressions of love. Okay? He, goes, he goes, he said, that's what he goes, you give a cup of cold water in my name? He goes, you crown me, I'm going to remember it forever, and he's going to wear it for eternity. Right? I mean, that's how Jesus deals with us. That's what he's, that's what he goes, this is who you are. You have access to me. And we can crown him with our love. All right, let's stand together. So the big areas here, uh, this, this section here, it's really transitional here. As she grows, as she learns of him as a safe savior. But in learning him as a safe savior, he invites her into the bridal paradigm, meaning he says, gaze upon the bridegroom king. Gaze upon the bridegroom king. Okay? And as we, you know, just, just wait on the Lord. A uh, thought I had earlier was this, going, you know, for many of us, we still, and we go through it, it's not like, uh, we go through it many times in our lives. Right? Different things happen. And going, do I know him as a safe savior? Or can I trust him as a safe savior? We trust him to certain degrees and then things happen in our lives. Right? Relationships, you know, God brings up different things. You know, betrayal, you know, whatever it is, we get hurt. And then the, the, the next step is, do I trust him again? You know, do I trust him again? Because trusting is painful. It means we're voluntarily allowing someone to come in. You know, I'm going to believe you. And the thing is, I did that last time and I got hurt. Okay? I trusted my dad and he hurt me. I trusted my spouse and you know, our relationship and they hurt me. Do I want to go down that road again? Jesus, are you going to be like that? Okay. And so over and over in our lives, it will come back going, you know, I trust him now. And then he goes, okay, now let's go deeper. Are you willing to trust me here?